back here. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to give an overview of where we've been and where we need to go. Uh, admittedly, our task force has endured many challenges and obstacles which have compromised our ability to fulfill the mission for which we were created. As you will recall, our purpose, as identified in Special Act Number 18-2, was to study the short and long-term needs of adults with intellectual disabilities, including those with significant behavioral health issues or significant issues related to aging, including Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and related disorders. We held four meetings starting in October 2019 until COVID stopped everything for 20, over 22 months. We reconvened on November 15th. We reconvened on November 15th and thought we were back on track again and held another meeting on December 15th, 2021. But we had to stop once more while the state legislature was in session which brings us to today's meeting. During our meeting, we invited presenters that include parent advocates, the commissioner of the Department of Developmental Services, the executive directors of the ARC Connecticut, of Disability Rights of Connecticut and Mid-State ARC, and of Developmental Disabilities Council. Parents of sons and daughters with intellectual disabilities in combination with other medical, mental health, behavioral, and or sensory conditions, as well as medical and healthcare professionals on topics of dementia and aging, service providers representing model programs, experts on assistive technology, and from others identifying some of the systemic challenges faced by individuals with intellectual disabilities, their families, and those that serve them. I want to also note that because our task force is considered to be a public agency, all our work, including discussions, preparation of drafts, revisions, and public comment must be done during duly scheduled task force meetings. After today's session, we'll have had 23 total presentations. Among these, the following topics were presented. DDS eligibility requirements, services, consumer served, waiting lists, parent advocacy of service needs on behalf of their adult children, behavioral health concerns in combination with intellectual disabilities, into, into intellectual disabilities in combination with dementia and Alzheimer's disease, systemic concerns, parent advocacy on behalf of their adult children with intellectual disabilities, as well as medical risk, mental health and behavioral disorders, sensory issues, physical disabilities, and or communicative disorders. In addition, we've heard on T DDS residential options, long-term services through the community first option, community supports and services, integrated employment, and today you'll hear about social and micro enterprises, as well as DDS new initiatives, new community housing options, serving individuals with complex needs in their apartments with assistive technology, staff shortages and turnover, shared living options, supporting individuals with behavioral needs in the community and characteristics of successful program designs. So those have been topics that we have heard and what I'm going to be proposing and posing to the committee is to determine whether we will, going forward, still need to have more information and to try to acquire that information or on the, uh, in, the, in the thoughts of the task force members, is there a feeling that we've reached a point where it's time to start bringing closure and ultimately get to the point where we can submit a final report? So I'll be coming back to that topic, and now we can go on to uh, having speakers. I just wanted to uh, add on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, 
because you know it took you know we were out of session for almost two years because of uh, COVID, and one of the hardest things in the world is to come back after a long layoff and get this thing back together. And I got to tell you, this task force is has stepped up to the plate, every one of its members to get this thing back to a right track. And I'm very, very confident, even though we've been out for a long time, we will get it back together. Thank you. Okay. All right. I am pleased to introduce our first speaker, Pam Donnaroma. Pam is the president and chief executive officer of Futures Incorporated. Her career has been built on having made and continuing to make significant contributions to improving the quality of life of individuals with disabilities. She is also an agent of systems change. For example, she introduced person-centered situational assessments in Connecticut in the early 90s. And she was one of the creators of the competency-based community assessment approach that became popular in the late 90s. Her contributions to systems change have been evident on local, state, and national levels. On the local level, she's been a member of her town's Board of Education, as well as a member of its Disabilities Commission. On the state level, she served as a member of Connecticut's Special Education Advisory Council, and she is the former chair and current member of Connecticut's Council on Developmental Disabilities. She also introduced the first state-approved private individualized services school in Connecticut, of which there may only be a few that exist throughout the entire country. Known as Future School, it was also recognized as a national model in the area of transition from school to work by the University of Minnesota. She also participated in creating experiential graduate training opportunities in school psychology, school counseling, mental health counseling, and social work at the University of Connecticut and Sacred Heart. Next generation professionals in these areas will have hands-on supervised clinical experiences with adolescents and young adults with intellectual disabilities in combination with emotional, behavioral, sensory, and or acquired brain disorders. What I have shared in this introduction only scratches the surface of her many program and system change accomplishment. Finally, by way of full disclosure, I was one of Futures co-founders. I am the president of its board of directors, and I am a consulting psychologist for its programs. Without further ado, Pam. We're having trouble hearing. Ah, oh, I didn't know I had to turn the mic on. <laughs> anyway, I had just introduced Damien and Damien is our CPA. He is the new executive director of Futures. We work in partnership. Um, he also happens to be a parent of a young man with intellectual disabilities and um, is also on the spectrum. So I'm really grateful that Damien and I have had a long working relationship. So he will be here to fill in the blanks and help me um, with our presentation in case I forget anything. So uh, how do we get started here? I was asked to present um, some innovative uh, programs to uh, assist people in employment in the community. Um, Futures um, started our social enterprise. We have, wait a minute, where are you going? Futures has a series of social enterprises. Um, can I go to the next slide here? All right. We have a little technical challenges here, and once we get going, we'll be fine. Um,
It was just on the screen. Okay, here we go. Let's start all over again. So um, Futures has been committed to doing social enterprises for a number of years. Um, and if we can go to the next slide. Um, we just wanted to give a, a definition and a clarification of the difference between a nonprofit and a social enterprise. Uh, we've been a nonprofit since um, 1995, but we've, you know, we entered into the world of social enterprises a number of years later. And with a social enterprise, it's a cause-driven business to improve the social objectives, serving the common good. All purchases from our good cause gifts um, enterprise are circled back into supporting our mission. At Futures, when we created our first social enterprise, our, um, our purpose was to create employment opportunities for individuals that we were supporting that had limited employment options in the community. And so we decided to create our own business. We have four ways to shop at Good Cause Gifts. You can um, shop in our Berlin store, um, the store at the um, Hospital for Special Care. We have a location in West Hartford. We also have an online presence. We currently employ 25 individuals with disabilities that were having real challenges finding employment. And our sales um, in 2021 hit $262,042. That's the impact we had. Now, although the numbers sound great, we'll talk about that a little bit later, um, but that was even during COVID. We were able to stay open during COVID. We kept everyone employed. We were recognized by Governor Lamont as one of the small businesses that didn't close during COVID and we didn't lay anyone off. This is a picture of some of our stores. We started off, and uh, if you see the, the tiny store to the left, it was driven by um, a family that just really wanted to make sure that their, their son who happens to have Down syndrome, autism and elective mutism had a real presence in the community. From there, we grew into uh, three additional locations. In one uh, store in West Hartford, right next to Bar Taco, a store at the Hospital for Special Care. We partnered with them to open up their gift shop and our, our main store, which is in Berlin. It's a very large store. It used to be a pharmacy. And we were able, through the support of the state of Connecticut, purchase the building and do the renovations. We now have an online presence. Oh, this is right there. There we go. Um, our online presence is a growing initiative and, and offers a lot of other employment opportunities um, for the people we support, you know, packaging, mailing. Um, at, the, um, at the store, there's a number of tasks that people are able to do. Uh, they go from um, customer service to um, greeting customers, opening merchandise, doing shipping, ticketing items, working on the displays, using the cash register, working on inventory, and a couple of the individuals that we support have even gone on vendorships out of state to help purchase some of the items that go into Good Cause Gifts. The whole feel of Good Cause Gifts is a real upscale feel, and that was what was really important to us. Um, we sell you know, uh, women's clothing, as well as um, local, local products, um, gift items, um, 
and um, we've had we've received a number of awards. Um, the store has been recognized as uh, the um, best uh, best gift shop in West Hartford, as well as the Spotlight Award out of West Hartford. Um, and we have we won one of the first Reset Awards. So uh, the store. Um, um, so the store has been recognized as not only um, being a place that has um, is is doing some social good, but as a place where you know people can come and buy the kinds of things that they would want to buy in any other you know high end or uh, gift shop or, or women's clothing store. The other thing that that we've been able to do with our social enterprises, not only to um, to employ individuals that were having some challenges finding competitive employment, but also be a, a source of fundraising for other nonprofits. One of our most recent initiatives is we are, and I don't know if you can see this, this is, uh, this is one of the cards that we're producing where 100% of the profits go directly to Ukraine. And um, we've identified an organization that is um, supporting individuals with disabilities in Ukraine. So those are the kinds of things in addition to um, our employment uh, goal that the, the, our social enterprises has, um, you know, has seen as part of our mission. Here's some pictures of our store in West Hartford. Um, One of our challenges is despite the revenue we've been, ever, ever been able to generate and the number of, of employees that we have, you know, we still have to fundraise because the cost of operations exceeds the amount of revenue that we're able to generate. So we, every year we have a gala, uh, we have a fashion show where we feature a number of, of the clothing items that we sell in the store. Uh, we have some very prominent models. Um, we've had the Lieutenant Governor, we've had the Mayor of West Harford, uh, this year, we hope that um, we have our governor's wife may be a model. So um, we have in attendance prior to COVID about 500 people. Uh, during COVID, we had a virtual event, but this, this fundraising event is critical to cover some of the shortfall in um, the cost of operations versus, um, you know, versus uh, our revenue. Um, However, we've had not only an impact on the individuals we serve, but you know, this is this is a comment from one of the parents that really was the um, the driving force in us getting started in in 2009. So we've been in business for over 13 years. Um, again, we were the first social enterprise incorporated in the state of Connecticut, and uh, have made hopefully a significant difference. Um, you know, Andy's mother feels very strongly that, um, that he has a place in his own community and that he's valued and that um, he has a purpose, a purpose that um, gives him pride. Um, Andy has really um, progressed since being part of, um, part of our agency and part of our um, social enterprise. So again, there are five ways to shop at Good Cause Gifts. You know, again, the uh, Berlin store, the Hospital for Special Care, um, the store in West Hartford, and online. We currently employ um, 15 people with disabilities. Oh, I'm sorry, we're off. Somehow my, my slides here, what happened here? They got a little jumbled up. Um, we're moving now into the kitchen. I know that at, at uh, Good Cause Gifts, we are now employing 25 people. Um, we have a, a second social enterprise and that's the kitchen. The kitchen um, has been around for about maybe six years. Um, we launched our, our commercial kitchen in Middletown. We have two commercial kitchens. Um, we have, um, We have um, menus, uh, we have the cafe, which is located at the hospital for special care. We have a grab and go in Middletown. We have a hot dog cart in Middletown. We also attend a number of farmer's markets where individuals 
will bake during the week and then go to the local farmers markets to be part of the community, you know, selling their product. We also have been doing more and more catering, particularly um, for business meetings. And um, we also have a holiday menu. Right now we have 15 individuals that are employed um, between the cafe and um, in, the, in the two commercial kitchens that we have. We will soon have a third commercial kitchen in, in Harford um, at our new location on Tremont Street. We also have a training kitchen in, um, in West Harford. I'm having a hard time seeing my slides. I apologize here. Technologically challenged. Um, one of the reasons I think that we have been able to be successful in our, in our social enterprises is we've been able to really attract some highly qualified individuals. So at the store, you know, we hired a, an experienced buyer, somebody who had worked in the retail industry for a number of years. Um, most recently, we were able to bring in an economist. She used to be the CEO of Coldwater Creek, and she has really helped us to really look at, you know, how we can further reduce the gap between you know, our revenue and, and our expenses. In the kitchen, we have, we have six professionally trained chefs. Um, they went to uh, uh, Roger Williams and, and um, not Roger Williams, um, uh, name, I always forget the name of that school here. Johnson and Wales, Johnson and Wales and, and the Culinary Institute. Um, and so the individuals that we support have an opportunity to do a variety of tasks in the kitchen. You know, some, some individuals have been, you know, trained in the culinary arts, prep work, um, and are, are working competitively and helping us in the, um, in the sales of, of our pastries. Here's our commercial kitchen, along with our hot dog cart. Our hot dog cart will serves two purposes. Um, it is a job site some of the time. Uh, a number of companies have, have rented out the hot dog cart um, for uh, their picnics, but it's, and Darlene will speak to, uh, it's also being utilized as, as a micro enterprise for those individuals that are interested in using it. And here are some of the products that the kitchen has been, you know, uh, producing anywhere from um, cookies to sandwiches to, you know, dinners. Um, they've done a, a nice job and we really are growing. They also are responsible in addition to, to providing all of the uh, food at the hospital special care cafe, they are also producing all of the lunches for um, future school in West Harford. Here's some of the impact that we've had on an individual basis. Um, we're really pleased that Valen, who had been working with with us for a while, has just been accepted to a culinary college. Um, and um, Gianna uh, specialized in cake decorating. Her goal was to go back and work in her, her home community and to get a job. She, was, she really was very successful at doing that. Carnez is working in a group home. He's learned to cook and now prepares food for his, uh, his roommates. And so um, Luann and Karina had, they're two of the individuals that have gone on buying trips to Boston. Um, Steven has really um, embraced his work in the kitchen. And uh, Darlene will be speaking about his special sauce that he has been working with the chefs in producing in order to uh, create his own small business. Uh, just in terms of, of really doing a little bit of a SWOT analysis, you know, I think, you know, using a social enterprise as an opportunity, and, and they have a lot of purposes, but for us, it was gainful employment for people that were having real challenges becoming employed. Um, it's an opportunity for, for training, you know, to, to train them so that they can get other jobs. It, it is competitive employment for those individuals that choose to, to stay on working in the kitchen because they like it. Um, it makes them feel valued, gives them a purpose, a contribution to the community. They've developed friends by working um, together. Um, and I think, you know, one of the uh, strengths of our social enterprises is that it raises money not only 
um, to keep people employed, but also for other nonprofits and other causes. Uh, we've been able to be relatively successful because we hire specialists in the areas that we're working, either in culinary arts or retail, and we, will, we are expanding in other areas. I think some of the weaknesses is that it's um, a challenge to run a business, particularly over the last couple of years. It's, it's difficult to find experts in, in culinary arts and um, in retail that know what they're doing and that are passionate about the work that we're doing. Um, I think that uh, we also are working with some of the individual challenges of the people that are employed and also developing some, some community awareness. Uh, in terms of opportunities, it does create, as you can see, a number of jobs. We're looking at currently supporting 40 people in competitive employment out in the community. And um, just to, to, to really emphasize, you know, they're, they're employed in locations at natural proportions. So we don't have a group of individuals working. Uh, there may be one in the Berlin store, you know, one in West Hartford at different shifts, a couple out in the community. We do pop-up stores. We do farmers markets, so our goal is is to um, to keep to norm, to um, to reflect the community. Um, I think some of the other opportunities it creates is is developing some social skills for some of the individuals that had some real challenges in 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 their social interactions, um, and you know working on um, making these social enterprises profitable. I think some of the threats we've had is that during COVID, it was very difficult to stay open. Um, and I think, you know, Damien could speak to the fact that, you know, we were, we're a nonprofit. Um, and so as a business, we didn't qualify, you know. Yeah, we're at, at times um, as a nonprofit, we're, you know, one of the major features of a nonprofit structure is to take advantage of, um, you know, not being taxed. And I think um, there's some there's some challenges with the social enterprises in that you know they don't they don't naturally get those um, tax exemptions and, and, and can you know realize some savings through that. But also during during COVID, we as a, the social enterprises didn't qualify for some of the supports that were out there. You know, as as a restaurant or as a food service program, because we were part of a nonprofit we didn't qualify for all the support that a lot of the restaurants received in Connecticut. And because we were a business, the, the, rest, the, um, the kitchen didn't qualify for any of the supports that nonprofits were receiving. So, um, so that really made you know, both the Good Cause Gifts um, and um, the kitchen and it made it a real challenge to survive COVID. So we're really proud that, that we're still in existence I think you know one recommendation would be for us to to try to ask the, the council to really look at you know um, you know how businesses social enterprises could could fit into another category with with some support. Um, I think you know again some of the threats are the lack of funding uh, that that we did receive some small funding from DDS in West Hartford to get started. I think we got a grant for 20,000. Um, in 2010, we received some funding to buy our first building. But other than that, you know, we have been using um, fundraising and the resources within our organization to make these the businesses grow. Um, and I think uh, one of the other challenges, again, is, you know, for good cause gifts is that we have to meet some very, very strict auditing standards. So uh, we best better hope that a pile of jeans doesn't get lost in the basement of Good Cause Gifts because our auditors come in and we need to account for, you know, the reconciliation between our square reports, you know, and, uh, you know, our SAGE report. Um, so I think, you know, that increases the cost of operations. I mean, it's a great thing, but also poses some real challenges. Um, so I think, you know, uh, I've been told that in the last four years, we've been able to double um, the revenue that we've generated. And um, our, our new economist has shared with me that since the beginning of our social enterprise, we have generated $650,000 in revenue. Um, 
in addition to the impact we've had in the number of people that we've been able to, to employ. Some, some individuals have moved on and some are still with us. Um, I have passed out, for those of you that are on virtual, you won't see that, but um, we did bring a, bas uh, uh, a, um, a bag with us with our kitchen menu, our sponsorship package to give you an idea of some of the fundraising we do. Um, one of the cards that we are selling at the store to support Ukraine and uh, specifically the disability population in Ukraine. And just to clarify um, what our, you know, a discount card for good cause gifts in case you feel like shopping. And um, at the bottom of the bag is a chocolate chip cookie. So on that, um, if anybody doesn't, if no one has any questions, you know, I'll introduce Darlene who, um, Darlene, are you there with us? I am here. Okay. Um, so <laughs> thanks to two grants we received, one from the town of Middletown a couple of years ago, and currently from um, a more generous grant from the DD Council, we were able to take our passion for creating businesses and employment to a whole new level with, with our micro enterprises. And we were, um, very excited to have uh, Darlene join us. Darlene is an attorney. She is extremely passionate about micro enterprises. She is creative and she is the mother of Ben. So with that, I will introduce uh, Darlene and let her take over. Thank you. Uh, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Thanks. So I've been asked to share with you some of the micro enterprises that I've been involved in. I just want to share this quote. I just love it so much. Don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that. Because what the world needs are people who have come alive. And I love that quote because what I do is I try to work with people on what makes them come alive and then try to turn that into a business. So you go to uh, two slides ahead. Um, okay, one back up. Yeah, this is it. Um, so what is a micro enterprise? A micro enterprise is a small business that's based on an individual's passion and interests and that's supported in their community. So what I do, next slide, what I do is I work with people to find out what's your passion? Do you have any hobbies? Are you good at something? Is there something that you really just get lost in when you're, when you're doing it? What inspires you? And we try to turn that into a business. Next slide. So here's an example. This is Katie. Uh, Katie likes hearts and rainbows. That's her passion. She's always drawing hearts and rainbows. She is um, comes almost every day to Futures Art uh, Department where they have a wonderful uh, art program. And so she was drawing hearts and rainbows. And, um, and so we said, well, how can we turn that into a business? So we reached out to um, the local cafe in her town, which is the Buttonwood Cafe, and we asked if they'd be willing to do kind of a partnership on an art um, display for Katie. So we had an art show at the Buttonwood Cafe. Um, they were happy to talk about her and we were happy to talk about the Buttonwood. So it was a nice partnership in town to let the town kind of know about Katie and to support her in her efforts and what she's doing. And then we were able to take some of her art prints and put them on bags, pillows, mugs, notebooks, keychains, um, all different kinds of products. Next slide. Uh, this is Chris. Chris um, has trouble with, uh, well, I mean, say trouble. He's, he's challenged in that he um, is deaf. He is legally blind. He is um, developmental um, delays. Also, he has autism intellectual disabilities. Um, so I was working, he's, uh, we're very lucky in that he has a very active family and his mom, Kate, uh, we were talking to her about how can we work with Chris on what his passions are. We're, we're um, trying to figure it out. It's very difficult. He doesn't talk, he doesn't um, write. And so it, it, it was a challenge to try to, what, what is it that floats Chris's boat? And we're committed to figuring that out and really have him show us that on his own terms. And one thing we found is that Chris loves hats. He collects hats. He probably has 200 to 300 hats at home. He takes them out of the closet. He hangs them on hooks. 
He sleeps with them. He loves hats. Which hat is his favorite to wear? No, he doesn't wear hats. <laughs> that was funny. Um, but Chris just loves hats. So that's a start for us. That's an end. Chris is inspired by hats. Hats is what really floats his boat. So we want to be um, working with him on something to do with hats. So we're, we decided we're going to make a, a hat line for him. You can go to the next slide. Some kind of product line that has to do with a hat, but has to be meaningful to Chris. So what is it about Chris and hats that is meaningful? So we started to have him go through um, pictures of hats online. He can kind of see if he looks very, very close. So we used a tablet to help him um, look at the hats very, very close. We also printed out all different types of hats and we put them on cards. And this is a several week process with Chris because to have him do something in one day, it's not gonna be meaningful to Chris. He really needs to feel like he's a part of it, that he's part of this product development, that he is part of um, the product as it goes forward. And uh, so one of the hat ideas we came up with was sign language. He does know some signs. And so we're developing a hat that has signs on it that he, he would identify and use. And that would be his hat line. We're, there is a store in his town that embroiders on hats. And so we're gonna partner with that store in order to get his hat um, produced. And when it's ready, we're gonna have a ribbon cutting where we're gonna have the mayor, we're gonna have the press, and we're really going to have um, community involvement to make the community aware of Chris's passions, of, of this product has to do with his input and it's really what he enjoys doing. He also loves to unpack hats from boxes and he has done that on some job sites. So this would also help with some of the job skills that he already has. Um, we, I say product development here because in speaking with his family, it's still not enough. This hat, um, the idea really does mirror what he enjoys and what his skill sets are, but he, it, he still really needs to have a hand in the actual product. So one of the art projects that he works on is spin art, where you put you know paint on kind of like a, almost like a record player that's turning around and that kind of splatters the paint. He really enjoys that. So we're gonna incorporate that somehow into his product. Next slide. So, so what if you don't have a passion? Not everybody has a passion. What if you're, you're, you, you don't know? So um, I want you to meet Toby. I don't have a picture because he didn't want me to take a picture of him, but he likes animated shows, video games, dinosaurs. He's very smart. He knows a lot about a lot. He can research. Uh, he has autism, but he's very, very verbal. He, he um, lack, lacks uh, confidence. Um, so when we ask him, what about your interests, hobbies, passions? He's like, no, I don't have any. Next slide. So we started asking him, well, what was your town like growing up? And, and what did you like to do as a kid? And one thing he started telling us about is he liked to go to the local park. And he started telling us fact after fact about the geese at the park and how they have teeth on their tongues. And we were very fascinated with this and he was very passionate about it. Next slide. And it gets, sure enough, geese do have teeth on their tongues and it's kind of scary. But we were fascinated and we started talking to him more about this. And the more we talked, the more and more interested he was um, because he was he wanted to get his concern out that you can't feed geese bread. Bread is like junk food for birds. So they have this great park in his town. People go there even when he was a kid and it annoys him to this day that they feed him bread because bread is junk food. It actually causes birds when they, they get fill, filled up on the bread and so they're not able to eat, uh, get all the nutrients that they really need from seeds and from insects and, and, and uh, water plants and that type of thing. So we did some research, next slide. And we developed a product. So we, from there we developed uh, a product called Goose Grub. So we made a prototype and we put all of the information and the research that Topi had done onto the, onto the packaging. And we, we are, he's going to use this to help educate the people in his town about um, what you, why you shouldn't feed geese um, bread. Next slide. And we have some goose grub here that we'll be passing around. Okay. Uh, so we're going to try to partner. We're, we're just starting our journey on, on, uh, with this product with him, but we're going to uh, try to partner with the local general store, which is right down the street from Hubbard Park, which is the park near his town, 
to see if they would sell this for him um, in their general store. And on the back of this package is the facts about um, why bread is bad for birds and that type of thing. And because Toby really likes dinosaurs, when you open up the package, there's a, um, a fact about dinosaurs, like a trivia, a little trivia fact about dinosaurs, just so he could get more of his interest, more of his passions in his own product. And same thing with this product. Once we have it in the general store, we're going to have a ribbon cutting. We're really going to about the community. So the community will really know about Toby, about his product, and really support the people in their own community. Our next slide. So I know Pam talked a little about the hot dog cart. Um, sometimes we have a, a, a business and it could be the anchor business for some other micro, uh, uh, sorry, micro enterprises. So for example, Stephen um, works at the hot dog cart and one of Stephen's passion, he loves food, he loves food. And so we were working with him and the, the kitchen chef to come up with a secret sauce so we got out so many ingredients and we tried many, many versions until we got one that Stephen thought was the one, his secret sauce. And uh, that is now being carried at the hot dog cart. And then for Ted, Ted works at the hot dog cart also. And while he likes hot dogs, it's not his passion. For Ted, he loves cars. If you ask Ted what's his favorite car, it's a Mustang. And he'll talk your ear off on it and it's wonderful. He's so passionate about cars. And so we developed a line of things for him that he can sell the hot dog cart that's more car related, like air fresheners and keychains and car magnets, that type of thing. And then we also developed um, a hat line, relish today, catch up tomorrow. Next slide. Bruce lives by the shore. And one thing about Bruce is uh, he wanted to do a bottle and can collection. So we asked, uh, we worked with him to try to figure out where in his town uh, is the biggest need for picking up bottles and cans. And we decided at the marina and he, they've got a beautiful marina in his town. So we made him a flyer that he can hand out and also a, um, a business card. And he particularly was impressed that he is the president of his company, BCG Bottles. And it gives him a lot of pride to hand out his card. So on his flyer, I asked him, what do you want people to know about you? You know, where, where this is your business, you are the president of this business. What do you want your community to know about you? And he told me, well, I know what I don't want them to know. I don't want them to know that I'm, I'm, I get angry. And so we talked a little bit about that because I, you know, everybody gets angry. Um, what do you do when you're angry? How do you, how do you deal with that? And he kind of looked at um, his staff that were helping him. And he said, you know, I try to take a walk by the ocean. Sometimes I look at the fishing boats. I, I practice deep breaths. And they said, let's put that on the flyer because there's a lot of people that get angry also. And so this could be really helpful, Bruce, to help people that also get angry. We can tell them, hey, if you're angry, take a walk by the ocean, watch the fishing boats, take long deep breaths. This, this could really help other people. So we added that to his flyer. Next slide. Marilyn also has a bottle and can collection. She's had this for years actually um, in Middletown, I think since 2018. And so just to make it a little bit more official, we made a flyer for her, we made magnets for her. But um, and when we try to come up with a name for her business, she speaks Spanish and Botellas is Spanish for bottle. So the name of her company is called Happy Botellas. And this artwork here is art that she's done in the art department. And so we've added that to her magnet that she hands out for her business. And so um, when she goes into businesses, instead of just asking for cans and bottles, which for her was difficult, she had um, she was kind of intimidated to go in and, and um, promote her business. So having a flyer is really helpful for her because she can give them the flyer and then they can read about what what her business is all about and when she, uh, how they can contact her. Next slide. So we also try to see what, what people already have for talents and skills. And sometimes um, it, you may not spot it right away. Next slide. So Ben loves sitting by a fire pit with friends. He loves to watch the shape and the color of the flames. Next, next slide. 
So for experience and talents, he can shred paper. So he can put colorful paper into a shredder. This can be very calming and comforting for him. For, um, he works with a special crinkle cut shredder, which you can only put in one page at a time. For some people, that would be very frustrating and monotonous for him. It really helps him relax. So that ends up being a good fit. So what can we do with crinkle cut shredded paper? And his passion is sitting by the fire. Uh, next slide. So we use the shredded paper, wax and sawdust to start a fire starter business. So he's able to create fire starters and sell them in his community. And they act like these little torches. And through the years, we've improved upon them to add rosemary and orange and really make them fragrant. So that's an example of some of the micro enterprises that I'm working on. And I guess the, the point of it is to really um, define what is success when it comes to micro enterprises. It's really to have a business that is about your passion, about something you love to work with every day that gives you purpose to get community support and recognition, to really have the community come out and say, we support this. This is somebody in our community um, that we wanna know more about. And so we really work with each individual on their own terms. Let me know if you have any questions. I don't have a question, but I uh, would like to uh, make a comment overall. Um, w watching this whole thing, listening, uh, I've been so impressed. Uh, first of all, you know, you know, great job, you know, to start with you two people uh, for sharing this with us, uh, sharing this entire thing with us and uh, to the speakers and, and meeting some of the uh, people who um, have compassion. Of course, uh, uh, Toby, I'd like to talk to him about dinosaurs one day. And uh, of course, you know, it's it shows that we can all be part of a great team called society. And these people have, you know, they're, they're part of this team and, and they're doing, I think, a great job. And uh, I'm hoping to uh, visit one of these uh, three stores very soon. I hope I get a chance to meet these people. I think this is uh, one of the most fascinating uh, things I've seen in my life. And um, there's not enough compliments I can make to the entire bunch of you for sharing you know this with us today and I hope you folks are in this a very very long time and you know God bless you thank you is there any other questions if not we'll pack up and okay thank you Thank you very much. Uh, actually, if you would um, send a electronic copy of that to to who? To you or to Bev? Oh, the bags. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Well, would you move? Wh where would be best for you? Uh, you have you got some powerpoints too, don't you? I okay. I assume that the cameras will be able to pick you up. Okay. Our uh, next presenter is Walter Glom.
Walter is the executive director of Connecticut's Developmental Disability Council, and he's a parent of a son with Down syndrome. After graduating from MIT, Walt worked for three decades in the tech sector before teaching graduate management and organizational development at the University of New Haven. In the meantime, Walt volunteered as an advocate for individuals who, like his son, live with developmental disabilities. He has been working as the executive director of the DD Council since 2017. Well, Thank you. All right, the mic is on. <laughs> um, so let me uh, let me get started with my screen share. And here we are. Okay. Uh, again, uh, I am the uh, executive director of the Connecticut Council on Developmental Disabilities. Uh, Orb invited me to come and uh, speak to you about the council. I want to cover three general areas uh, in, in my presentation. First, I want to introduce you to the council and the scope of the work that we do and what our role here is in Connecticut. Uh, then I would like to uh, talk a little bit about our perspective on unmet needs. This was at Orb's uh, request. Uh, and then uh, some thoughts about what we might do about it. Uh, this is definitely gonna be a 30,000 foot view because there's a lot of things we do and in 30 minutes there's just no way we can drill down into into all of our activities uh, so uh, without further ado let me uh, dive into it okay uh, <clears throat> the council has been in connecticut for 50 years uh, we are created in federal statute uh, we receive no appropriation from the state of connecticut we are entirely funded by an annual formula grant from the uh, uh, federal uh, administration on uh, administration for community living which is part of the department of health and human services uh, our purpose is to engage in advocacy capacity building and systemic change activities uh, that will help connecticut develop better community services and individualized supports for people with developmental disabilities so that they can live in their communities exercise self-determination independence productivity um, and generally be fully included in community life. Uh, that's what we're all about. Uh, we are not a service provider. Uh, we, our job is to fund innovation and systems change. Uh, now, our purview is developmental disability, which is defined in the act. Uh, and I'll tell you, there's some frustration in that uh, if you look across the different parts of the government, you'll find that NIH, CDC, uh, the DSM, and the Census and the DD Act all define this differently. But you know, I live by the Developmental Disabilities Act. This is our definition, uh, and it is a functional definition. Okay, a developmental disability is any condition uh, that results in substantial functional limitations in three or four, three or more areas of uh, of, of life skills. Uh, is manifest before the age of 22 and is lifelong and requires uh, lifelong supports and services. Uh, you'll notice there's no I in, in the DD Act. Uh, in, intellectual disabilities uh, may fit this definition, many do. I understand your function is on ID and I'm gonna come back to that, but just understand that as far as the council's concerned, our purview is a little bit broader. So uh, there may be physical disabilities, uh, psych, behavioral, uh, other conditions that may not fit the definition of ID that are still of concern to us. And I'm gonna come back to that before I'm through here. Uh, uh, also note that, you know, the, the, the substantial word in there, you know, it, it's substantial, it's a, the, the definition says substantial functional definitions, kind of begs the question, what is substantial? And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that before we're through here. Uh, I'll also throw in a note here that According to the people I work for, the Federal Administration for Community Living, uh, their estimate is that it's about 1.6% of the population who have a developmental disability, according to this definition. Now, of course, you know what that number is depends somewhat on how you define 
substantial or severity. Uh, uh, I'm a numbers guy, as you can tell from my bio. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking a bit about numbers here. So I wanted to throw this out just as a benchmark. Uh, but this is the world that we're concerned about. You know, we estimate approximately 32,000 adults uh, with developmental disabilities in Connecticut that, that, that are our concern. And again, that's not all intellectual disabilities and well on that in a minute. Okay, back to the council. Uh, what do we actually do? Okay, we don't have much of a staff. We have two, two people, myself and my secretary. Otherwise, we are a grant making organization. You know, we, we drive innovation through grants to organizations that, uh, you know, will educate, train, or demonstrate, uh, you know, new and better practices. Uh, examples of what we've done in the past is uh, we run an annual partners in policy making leadership training program, which uh, we're very proud of, uh, training uh, <coughs> families and individuals with disabilities uh, how to advocate for themselves. Uh, we typically spend uh, nearly half of our, our funds one way or another uh, developing or providing direct support to self-advocacy organizations. Uh, we believe, uh, because the federal law tells us to believe, <laughs> that uh, the uh, services should be designed and directed by the individuals they serve. Okay, the people receiving services need to have a voice. Uh, and in order to have a voice, as a practical matter, you need to be organized. So we spend a fair amount helping self-advocates organize themselves, understand how, how the process works and how to speak up. Uh, and also to inform us on what the needs are. Uh, I mean, I am a dad uh, of, a, of a man with Down syndrome, so I know a little bit about it, but uh, he knows more than I do about what his needs are, and I listen to him, and I, and, and I listen to others. Uh, we were instrumental in bringing Charting the Life course, uh, person-centered planning tools to Connecticut in collaboration with DDS, and that's gone very well. Uh, we've done a lot in the customized employment space, uh, which I hope is about to become a reality. Uh, at least at DDS, but hopefully also at BRS and in and, and, and the education system. And forgive my use of acronyms, but we're all family here. I, I hope you, you can follow. Uh, we were instrumental in creating the first comprehensive transition post-secondary program in Connecticut in uh, collaboration with Goodwin University. Uh, this is the first program where individuals with intellectual disabilities can go to college with modified curriculum and still qualify for FAFSA, which is huge. Okay, uh, previous without that designation, uh, you can go to college, you can take modified classes, but you couldn't get financial aid. Uh, so uh, uh, we're very proud of that. Uh, we've invested in resources for individuals to self-direct, for supported decision-making as, as a, an alternative to guardianship. Uh, and uh, I'm especially proud of our recent work in providing accommodations for COVID-19 vaccinations for people with developmental disabilities. Because I have to say that the uh, public health infrastructure in Connecticut really failed uh, this population. Uh, we had many people coming to us telling us that they were being denied accommodations, uh, necessary accommodations to get their vaccines uh, for things like uh, conditions like anxiety disorder, schizophrenia, intellectual disability, level three autism. Uh, so we actually uh, set up a clinic where we demonstrated what those accommodations would look like and now we're in the process of disseminating that information. Uh, so that's, that's the past. Uh, we work with the feds on a five-year cycle. We just began a new five-year plan uh, in October. We're on a federal, we work on a federal fiscal year beginning on October 1st. And these are some of the things that we're working on currently. Uh, assistive technology. For the next five years, we will be investing in projects to promote assistive technology, see that any, everybody who can use it has access to it. We think it's a great lever for helping people live independently uh, in the community in their own homes. Social enterprise and entrepreneurship. Uh, as Pam noted, uh, we have a grant to Futures. Uh, we're very pleased with the work they're doing. Um, so uh, the idea is to bring that mentality and uh, private capital uh, into the space. Uh, uh, again, we're gonna be investing in self-advocacy organizations with a special focus on uh, underserved communities. So we'll be partnering with organizations like Health Equity Solutions, the uh, Ministerial Health Fellowship, AFCAMP and others to you know, understand what barriers to access uh, uh, people uh, face in, uh, 
in minority communities or, or in, 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 in culturally diverse uh, communities. I'll come back to this a little bit later. Uh, uh, we're interested in seeing that the Office of the Governor and the legislature for that matter are better informed about all the groups uh, in, in Connecticut. Uh, we count nearly 50 organizations in Connecticut that have organized themselves to advocate for individuals with disabilities of one type or another. Uh, and I'm not sure they're always heard. Uh, it's a great resource. I mean, the council is among them, but we're not the only one. Uh, and uh, we wanna be sure that the government is aware of these, uh, these organizations and that they have a voice. Again, nothing about us without us. Uh, you know, these systems should be designed with input, if not at the direction of the uh, people who are gonna be served. Uh, we do, we will continue to educate parents and caregivers with uh, programs like Partners in Policymaking, but we're funding several others as well. Uh, uh, one that's really uh, key for me that I'm excited about is we're gonna be spending more uh, on educating professional providers and public officials of generic services. Uh, this is motivated largely by the experience we had with the vaccines. Uh, most of our folks now are not living in special facilities. Uh, they are living in the community. They're living in their own homes, their parents' homes, uh, independently, uh, which means they're more reliant on generic services, the same doctors, hospitals, supermarkets, healthcare system, transportation system, and all that everyone else uses. Uh, much of that infrastructure is not prepared. Uh, you know, it seems there's a mentality that uh, perhaps uh, outside of DDS, for example, uh, there's a belief that maybe somehow folks with disabilities are taken care of somewhere else. Now, uh, you know, DDS itself is actually quite progressive in moving people into the community, uh, but the community needs to be prepared. So we're gonna be doing things to educate the public health infrastructure, uh, uh, healthcare providers and others, uh, you know, that they serve people with disabilities. And, you know, as <laughs> like we said back in 1990, when the ADA was passed, you know, it's about more than wheelchairs. You know, it's not just about having wide doorways. You know, how do you handle a person with schizophrenia? How do you pr handle, handle a person with things, extreme anxiety disorder, level three autism and on and on, okay? And the most recent thing uh, we're, we're excited about is we've been selected as one of the first five states in the nation to join a new uh, national uh, community of practice to bridge aging and disability networks. The idea being that we have these, these silos uh, doing very similar things, right? And then we draw this line at age 65 and say, well, if you're under 65, you can't have this. We have it for people older, but not for you, right? So, you know, yet there's a lot of the similar things going on. So we're gonna be doing, bring together the stakeholders and, and the providers in Connecticut to see what we can do to better coordinate, collaborate, even consolidate some of those services. Okay, this is that's our current state plan. Uh, <clears throat> another thing I, I want to just mention, and again, there's no time to drill into any of this. Uh, as a part of uh, writing our five-year plan, we are required by the federal government to do a comprehensive review and analysis of the situation in Connecticut, including demographics, prevalence of disabilities what services and supports are available in the state uh, and what and unmet needs are there. And then that drives our thinking on what we should be doing over the next five years. Uh, uh, no time to go into this in detail, but you know, to the legislators who are present, just be aware we're here, we're a resource. Uh, we cost you nothing, you know, we're on the federal dole, <laughs> we're paid for by the federal government, uh, or as they used to say, you know, we're from Washington and we're for here to help. You know? So uh, we have data. Now, talking about unmet needs, uh, again, I'm a numbers guy. So one of the things that intrigues me or that I wanna look at when we're talking about unmet needs is how many, right? What's the scale of unmet needs? I mean, we, we always have, there's always somebody with something that they're not getting, right? Uh, my concern, one of my concerns is how many? And a simple way of doing this is to say, okay, let's, let's figure out how many people out there have the need. That's a demographic exercise, right? I mean, we have statistics on the prevalence of various conditions, diseases, call it what you will, uh, you know, functional needs. <clears throat> we know how big the population is. There's ways to estimate how many people 
uh, have a need. And then let's look at how many people we're actually serving with that need. The difference is unmet need, right? I mean, it's pretty simple arithmetic. Now, of course, it's not that simple because this very, you know, you have to do this on a condition by condition basis, you know? So there's a lot of dimensions to this. And the other thing, it, it doesn't really say anything about the quality. Just because somebody's receiving a service, you know, on the books doesn't necessarily mean their needs being met. So there's a quality aspect too, I admit. But still, I think particularly for the legislature and when it comes to budgeting and deciding what service delivery methods we're gonna use, we have a handle on the scale, how big things are. And again, you know, forgive me, this is me, I'm a numbers guy, right? So how many people are disabled? Begs the question, what is disabled, okay? What we typically do, okay, is we assume that for any ability, you know, essential ability in life, that the level of ability is distributed across the population on a normal curve. Now there's mathematical reasons why that shaped curve ought to be the one. I don't have time for that tutorial today. Uh, but what we do is we say, okay, you know, most people have kind of average ability, which is, you know, shown on this chart. And then there's some people who have better, more than average ability. And then there's some people who have less. And in defining disability, we draw a line somewhere to the left there, you know, to, you know, where you're, your, your less, your lack of ability, call it disability, is at a level, you know, where you just can't function, okay? And we draw a line, okay? And we do that, and, and that scale can be a, a physical condition, you know, a mobility concern, a, a, a psych issue, behavioral, sensorial, any number of things, okay? Um, and again, in my world, you know, with that broad definition of disability, that there's a, this is a multidimensional problem. But in estimating how many people there are, this is kind of how it's done, okay? You assume a Gaussian or normal distribution, you decide what, how, you know, where you draw that line and the number of people out there, you know, left of that line, that's, that's your population that, of, of disabled. So getting back to this committee, your focus is intellectual disability, okay? Now for intellectual disability, there is a well-established metric, it's called IQ. And IQ by definition is a normal, standard normal curve, by definition, okay? With a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. And we commonly say that, you know, it's pretty common to define intellectual disability as anyone with an IQ uh, that's less than or, or more than two standard deviations below the mean, and that's 70, okay? So any IQ below 70, by definition, intellectual disability, okay? Now, there's, there's an adaptive functioning dimension to this too, which I'm gonna get to in a minute, but, you know, as a start, here's a simple definition, and, and it's mathematical, by the way, okay? That the, the number of people below that curve, with, with IQ, IQ below 70, it's about 2% of the population, okay? I'm rounding because it, the math is easier if, I, if it's two. It's between two and three. Say again? Worldwide, that's a definition, okay? So worldwide. Now, you know, there's a lot written about how valid this is and, you know, does it vary, you know, by region, race, whatever. I, I just don't have time for that, but the, this is a definition of, of intellectual disability. IQ is defined as this curve. Intellectual disability is defined as those with IQ less than 70. And that population is about 2%. And that's a mathematical constant. I mean, it, it's, it's out of a math handbook. It has nothing to do with who you're talking about or where you are. Now, how well that matches reality is a whole other area of research. I, well, well, there's a question of whether you're tested or not. I'd be happy to engage in that discussion when we have time. I, I hear you, I hear you, okay. <clears throat> but this is the definition, okay? So if you have about 3 million adults in Connecticut, and you do, more or less, again, I'm using round numbers because it's easy to do the math, okay? 
This tells me that I must have about 60,000 adults in Connecticut who probably have an intellectual disability, more or less. Okay, that's the top line in my equation. How many people have the need? Okay, just by definition. Okay. Now let's look at how many we serve. Okay, this is the latest mirror from DDS. Okay, and you'll see that the number of people in the DDS system, it's about 17,000 people who we acknowledge, you know, who are getting services or at least on the books at DDS. Now, I, I'm not here to dig through this chart. Krista's gonna be up next and I, I don't wanna get into a fight with Krista. So we're, you know, you got 17,000 in there uh, not all of them get all the services that they need. You'll see, you know, only about 5,000 are getting residential services. Everybody else is living wherever else they're living, but they're not getting residential supports. Uh, you got around 8,000 who aren't getting any funding. They're, they're known to the system, but they don't have a budget, right? Okay. But my point is, if demographics tell me that I must, I've got around 60,000, now you can argue that 60, whether it's 50 or 65 or 55, okay. But it's a, if it's a number like that and DDS has 17, I see an unmet need, okay. And this discrepancy, this disparity between the demographic analysis and what the state is actually doing is not unique to Connecticut, okay. Uh, this is a quote from it's the same source that I used uh, when I gave you the number, the, the prevalence of, uh, of DD, you know, from the Federal Administration of Community Living has been looking at this problem. And uh, I love this quote, administrative data sets provide incomplete and potentially misleading information for the purpose of estimating prevalence of IDD and measuring health disparities and unmet needs because you're only counting the people who came in the door, right? You're only counting the people who came and got services. You're not counting the people who didn't, okay? Now, you know, in fairness to the people of running the system, you know, they might say, well, gee, how can I know what I don't know? I mean, you know, these are the people in front of me. This is what I know about. But nevertheless, there's, a, there's, there's this other demographic analysis that can't be ignored, okay? So what I'm suggesting here is that there's a sizable population of people with intellectual disability who are not being served by our by the agency which we have established to to serve people with intellectual disability and i think we should ask why where is everybody right and i can think of a few possibilities okay uh, the first one gets back to this issue of adaptive functioning because eligibility for DDS services really has two pieces, right? There's an IQ of 69 or lower and uh, significant uh, uh, you know, problems with adaptive functioning. Uh, so could it be true that most people with IQ below 70 actually don't have a, la a problem with adaptive functioning? Like two thirds. Well, wait a minute. I mean, I, 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 I don't think that's true. And, and, and as you may know, there's a lot of literature that on this, I, I don't have time to drill into. Okay, certainly some, cer certainly gonna be some people with lower IQ who are just fine. They don't have a problem with adaptive function. Okay, but to say that two thirds of that population or more than half of that population don't have a problem with adaptive functioning, I'm, I, don't, I haven't seen any data that, that suggests that but it's one possibility, right? The second bullet I'm much more concerned about, okay? Are there cultural, economic, or demographic barriers to access, okay? And this is an area where the council is gonna be investing money over the next five years in this area of self-advocacy for diverse, culturally diverse and marginalized communities, okay? I do believe, okay? And, and we're gonna find out by going to those groups, right? and asking them, I do believe that we have communities that are not accessing, accessing services for a variety of reasons, okay? Now, you know, again, DDS works on this. I mean, you know, I, I don't think it's a language barrier because they're pretty, the, the state's been pretty good about generating stuff in the languages that are, you know, spoken by communities in Connecticut. 
Is it cultural? Right? What is it? Now, again, we could spend an afternoon talking about that issue, but it's one of the ones that the council is concerned about and that we're going to be working on. Okay. The next one concerns me too, is how many of these people are, are not get, taking services because family's taking care of them, right? They've got a strong community. They've got a strong family. They don't need services. I get brothers, sisters, parents, aunts, uncles, extended family, church, whatever. And they're getting what they need without state services until those services disappear, right? A parent passes away, becomes disabled, whoever it was that was helping them is no longer available and they appear as an emergency. And we know this happens because I get calls every other month and I know the commissioner does too, okay? These are the emergencies. These are people who appear, they're not on an existing waiting list. They're not known to us, they just appear, okay? They've been out somehow being taken care of and now it's an emergency. They need a place to live. They need someone to help them get them dressed. They need something, you know, they need that support. Okay, and it's a bit of an issue for, you know, if it's a 50 something year old individual whose parents just passed away and other siblings bring them to us and say, we need help. Well, the eligibility criteria require that that person have an IQ test before the age of 18 on record in order for them to get services from DDS. Well, if they're 50 years old, maybe they didn't get an IQ test before they were 18. And even if they did, the school records don't exist anymore. Well, that's that's the cultural thing. Yes. Yes, I I absolutely. I mean, I, you know, I you know, look at me. You can I I come from a certain demographic, okay? My culture, I have no trouble coming down here and you guys have seen me over the years sitting in that chair, you know, and wear it on my sleeve. I have no trouble, you know, announcing to the legislature, I'm a parent. I have a son with down syndrome and he needs help and I want you to do something about it. Now, there are other communities who are re reticent to do that, okay? You don't talk about it. You don't, and, and again, this is an area that the, for the next five years, we're committing funds to engage those communities and have those conversations and understand that. You know, how, 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 how do we serve those individuals? I mean, they have the need and it's it's too easy to say well oh they, well they well they don't want it okay no that's not enough okay so that's the second bullet so there's this you know how many people are in the wings how many people are out there and and you know understand that over the last few decades the life expectancy of people with these disabilities has been expanded extended right back you know not too long ago people with Down syndrome didn't live past their 30s okay now the life expectancy for Down syndrome is is, is approaching the general population. So, you know, again, we, we need, in my opinion, we need to do a better job with demographic studies to give us a handle on how many are out there or analyze what we do know, like these emergencies are, who are coming in, where are they from? You know, what kind of data do we have at DDS to tell us, you know, what's going on here? I don't have access to that data. I don't work for DDS, okay? And then the last possibility is, you know, the, the whole demographic analysis is, is, is predicated on the validity of the IQ. Well, personally, I think the IQ is a terrible metric. I think we should throw it away, but you know, it, it's there. I mean, there's an industry behind it that, that pushes it, but you know, maybe that's not the right distribution. Maybe it overestimates, I don't know. Okay, so, but that's, you know, that's the first point I wanna make. I don't have the answers, you know, we don't have a lot of time today, okay? But wait, there's more, okay? And I'm sorry, I don't have a nice set of kitchen knives for you, but we, uh, again, my concern is for a broader audience, okay? And it was back in the 80s when HHS started this move away from defining disability in terms of diagnoses which is what they used to do. It used to be developmental disability was Down syndrome, cerebral palsy, et cetera. Okay, they got rid of that and they went to this functional definition, which I showed you. And the motivation for that, and the, the seminal paper on that was Dr. Golay in 81, okay? It's how long it's been since the rest of the world's been moving away from these IQ and other, other met, met metrics, okay? 
is that individuals with different conditions share certain characteristics and apply shared service needs, okay? I think there's a real need for us to take a look at, you know, where do we have common needs? Even though we built a system that says, well, mental health is over here and aging is over here, and intellectual disabilities are over here. Well, if the need is housing, it's pretty much the same kind of thing that you're trying to do, you know, regardless of, you know, if the need is employment supports, the supported employment, the thing you do, the service you provide for supported employment is not substantially different, whether it's intellectual disability, uh, behavioral health, or aging, or, or, or level three autism, whatever, okay? So uh, the scary thing here, of course, that this potentially means larger numbers, but then again, you know, if you go back to my earlier slide, according to the, the feds, their estimate on this total population for developmental disabilities is only about 1.6% of the population, which means, they're, they're, means, which means their severity bar is, is way out to the left. I mean, <laughs> that, that's, you know? So I think there's some thinking that needs to be done about you know, where these people are and how big these different populations are, okay? Uh, again, you're the ID group, and uh, one of the points here is that if you look at where the money is, now this is, this is the last biennium, forgive me, but that's when I did this analysis uh, for, for Washington. Uh, uh, this was the, the 2021 biennium. I don't think that the relative rankings of things have changed significantly. Obviously, the numbers have all changed a little bit, especially with all the ARPA funds that flowed in. This was pre-COVID. Uh, but the point is that if you look at where the state puts money for developmental disabilities, almost all of it goes to DDS, exclusively for people with IQ 69 and lower. And yet you have these other populations with similar needs. And what are you doing for them? Okay. Compare the DDS budget to the autism waiver. I mean, it, 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 there's no comparison. Okay, the autism waiver Great attempt, but you know, I, I have to say it's pathetic. I mean, compared to the need, the amount of money that's going in there, what's available. And yes, yes. So, so, you know, again, this issue of, you know, we put a lot of resources into ID, which I mean, for this group, you know, good for us, you know, and again, my son has ID, so I mean, I, you know, I'm enjoying the largesse. But if I take the broader view and look at all of developmental disabilities and where all, the, all these needs are, there's so many people with the same needs as that ID population who can't access those services. They're not eligible for DDS because their IQ too, is too high. They may have other issues, okay? Behavioral health, I mean, aut level three autism is, looms large in this area. You know, a lot of people with higher IQ, but they really need the services, okay? But the state puts most of the money into DDS with an eligibility criteria that, that begins with IQ 69 or lower, okay? Something to think about. Uh, I wasn't sure where to put this slide, but it's something I've been dying to say. Uh, when we look at innovating, and that's my job, you know, is systems change and innovation, okay? Uh, if we're looking at changing service delivery and what's the best way, you know, the greatest good to the greatest number, okay, three questions always come to my mind. Okay, and I don't have the answers, but I think these should be our guiding principles, okay? Is it scalable, okay? Whatever the solution is, is there a way to do this for everybody who needs it, okay? It's a cost issue. I mean, part, part of this is a cost and resource issue. You know, are you gonna be able to find the people? Are you gonna be able to pay them? Are you gonna be able to get, eventually get to a, an appropriation level that's gonna take care of everybody? Okay, because right now we have a system which I think is waiting list by design, right? Is it sustainable? Okay, whatever funding source you're using, you know, are you gonna be able to keep this up? These are annualized costs, okay? I'm very concerned about what we just did with ARPA funds, right? We put a lot of ARPA money into areas which to me look like recurring annualized costs. What happens in two years when that money's gone? Okay, as an example. And finally, equitable. At the end of the day, 
you never have enough money to serve everybody. We have waiting lists. It's just a fact of life. So is the system, I mean, is your rationing system, and let's, that's what we do. We ration these services, especially waiver services. They're capped, right? How do we decide who gets it and who doesn't, okay? And can we defend that? Is it an equitable system that we can all look at and say, yeah, okay, I didn't get any, but a person who has a greater need than me did, right? Okay, something to think about, okay? Okay. Uh, Silos, okay, silos are bad, okay? And we are siloed, you know, that's how we operate, okay? We, we created silos around these narrow diagnostic, uh, you know, diagnoses, and we, we're, again and again, we find people who fall between the cracks, especially in behavioral health, level three autism, you know, that kind of stuff, you know? Well, you don't fit in DDS, you don't fit in DEMIS, the autism waiver doesn't have room for you, sorry. Okay. Okay. This is about, you know, how we write eligibility criteria. Okay. How do we, you know, how do we fix this? Now, an example, a shining star, I think, is a community first choice program. Okay. Okay. The idea would be to move to a universal assessment. Does, I don't care what door you walk in. I don't care whether you're going, you, you, you're, you're DEMIS, DDS, whatever. The, eligible, the assessment that determines your need and what you're going to get is the same for everybody. It's a functional assessment, okay? Which, by the way, go back to the DD Act, okay? They wrote that, the ver current version I'm working with was written in 2000, okay? Not a bad guideline, okay? Functional definition, okay? You know, you need employment supports. What difference does it make, whether it's because you have a low IQ or you have a behavioral health issue, or you have sensory issues, you know, I don't know. It's, what's your functional need? And is it severe enough to merit public assistance, which is limited, right? Okay, so uh, the idea of moving to a universal assessment, I think is key. CFC is a good example. The work that Dawn Lambert's doing at DSS, I think is a model. If you haven't had her come and talk to you, please do, okay? Uh, uh, I think that's, that's the future, okay? <clears throat> and, you know, I would also note, you know, I hope you've all read the Connecticut Creates report, you know, that was done by uh, Boston Consulting Group for the governor a year, year and a half ago. Uh, but this is one of the things that they, they looked at is that, you know, we have certain services. In fact, they called out employment supports as an example of something where, you know, we might do well to do better coordination, if not consolidation, okay? You have supported employment programs at DDS. You have supported employment at DEMAS. You have BRS with federal voc rehab money, and then the Department of Labor runs American Job Centers, okay? Now, since 1990, the ADA says any public service has to provide accommodations. So any person with a disability should be able to walk into an American Job Center, which is supported by Department of Labor with federal support uh, and say, I need a job. And if there's a disability involved, whatever it might be, intellectual, behavioral, sensory, that office has to accommodate it. And I have to tell you, I, I sit on one of the subcommittees of the Governor's Workforce Council. So I'm at a table with people from all these different places. And I'm impressed with the quality of the people we have in American Job Centers and their willingness to work with people with disabilities. The problem is they'll do their job, they'll find the job, the placement for the person, but then that person can need on the job supports. Where does that come from? Well, the people, the only agency that's really set up to do that on an ongoing basis is DDS, but if your IQ is over 69, sorry, I can't help you. So you have people at the American Job Centers who are frustrated that okay, a person with a disability came to me, I found an accommodation, I found them a job, three months later they got fired because they didn't get the supports they needed because the AJCs aren't set up to do that, okay? The resources are in the government, they're around, okay? And this is just one example. I mean, that's employment, you know, but, you know, 
what can we do to better, at least better coordinate, if not consolidate? Now, consolidation is, you know, heavy lift, right? But at least better communication, seamless pass through. I mean, once upon a time, people talked about having a no wrong door system. Ha, you know, not for this population, okay? So, uh, you know, what are we gonna do about, you know, mitigating the problems with the silos, okay? Just a couple more things and then I'll be done, okay? Uh, of all the, the areas of emphasis that we, that we have to deal with, okay, uh, under the federal law, which is education, healthcare, uh, uh, housing, transportation, the one that I'm most concerned about and I think we need to do the most about sooner than later is housing, okay? Okay, we have a real housing crisis in Connecticut, okay? Duh, I mean, it's on the papers every day. But for this population, you know, it's acute, okay? Used to be, you had Down syndrome, you were put in an institution. Now we don't do that anymore, okay? Most of our folks now, and I'm talking about just ID, but it's the, also the larger DD population. Most of our folks are now living in the community, in their own homes or apartments or with family, whatever. And we've developed the systems to bring services to them. Okay, so now the service is attached to the person, not to the place, right? Person-centeredness, it's all over, right? Everyone's got that on their, their website now. We're all person-centered, okay? And we've got a number of programs to do it, right? We have uh, self-directed waiver services. We've got CFC. I mean, we've got stuff. We, we have the means. They're not perfect. They may be underfunded. There's you know, workforce wor wor worker shortages, but we have the, the scaffolding at least, if not the programs in place to give people the supports they need to live in the community, personal care assistance, assistive technology, whatever it's gonna be but they still need a place to live, right? And people need to understand that, you know, the funding sources for these individual supports don't pay room and board, right? Am I getting ahead of myself? Yes, there we go. The funding sources don't pay room and board, right? Medicaid will not pay your rent. Medicaid will not buy food for you. It'll pay for a person to help you do all these things, okay? Okay, so you need some kind of cash assistance, and for most people, that's their SSI, Social Security, right? But Social Security is not nearly enough to pay rents in Connecticut, never mind your food, your transportation, the other things that you need, okay? Now, you know, there are efforts to work on this, but they're all coming up short, okay? And, you know, we could support more people in the community with... CFC with self-directed waivers, if there were places for them to live that are affordable, okay? So uh, our community, okay, those of us who are advocating for uh, services for people with developmental disabilities, we have got to make affordable housing a priority, okay? And we're not alone. I mean, it's a, lot, it's a big community out there screaming for the same thing, okay? And I will, I'll, I'll make an opinion, I'll give an opinion the answer is not more subsidies, okay, okay? It's not a question of expanding Section 8 or having more RAP certificates. It's a question of having more housing that's intrinsically affordable, okay? And the biggest impediment to that, I believe, and I'm not the only one, is local zoning ordinances, okay? It's a problem, okay? We have to compel towns, okay? I'll be on the front page of the Hartford Current tomorrow, okay? Okay, we have, we have to get, the state has got to get engaged to towns to allow more multifamily homes, accessory units, tiny homes, and co-living, okay? We have too many places with exclusive, exclusionary zoning that says, well, if you're not all the main members of the same family, you can't live in the same house, right? Okay, uh, if you want to put an accessory unit on your house, you have to have another acre of land. I mean, you know, there's all of this stuff. And if you've followed it in the paper, there's, it's all been written. Don't, I don't have to dwell on the details, but you know, this is unacceptable. I mean, when a town says, oh no, we can't do that. It's gonna change the character of our town. I mean, what character are they talking about? 
okay? Is that character exclusive discrimination against people with disabilities? There, I said it, okay? Again, I'll be in the Hartford Current tomorrow morning. But we need to get more serious about affordable housing, okay? And then my final point in terms of solutions is gets back to this idea of generic services, okay? Since 1990, the law says anybody who provides public accommodations, whether you're the state of Connecticut or the town or a private enterprise, you have to provide accommodations to people with disabilities. And we need to do more of this, okay? Transportation, healthcare, uh, recreation. I mean, all this stuff, okay, needs to be made uh, accessible and accommodations have to be available. And what we found with the vaccines was that they weren't is that healthcare providers were blatantly denying accommodations to people who are requesting them. Now, you know, there's a legal remedy there, but that's not my job. My job is to work with the state to figure out, okay, let's assume for a moment that the reason you're not doing this is because you just don't know how, okay? So let's work on that. And the council will be investing over the next five years in working with uh, particularly the public health infrastructure to see that you know, everybody from the community health worker up to the administrators understand how do you accommodate a person with level three autism? How do you accommodate a person with intellectual disabilities in your existing infrastructure? We don't need special clinics. We need the existing infrastructure to be accommodating. And I'm sorry if I went over my time, but here I am. Uh, we are the Council on Developmental Disabilities. We're here to help. Uh, part of our mission is informing the administration and the legislature you know, on these issues. Uh, I'm on call. Please you know, don't hesitate to, uh, to bring us in. Uh, you don't have to listen to what we say, but you know, we, we have something to say. So thank you. Well. No, once again, no questions. First, I wanted to thank you for coming. And, you know, for a man who said he didn't have all the answers, you had a lot of fantastic answers. Uh, he just, you know, didn't know it, but uh, you, you hit a lot of things on, on the, the head, on the, the nail on the head there. Um, when you, uh, accommodations, uh, people who need jobs, who uh, we have called, you know, the American Job Center here in my town of East Hartford. And I want to let you know, I am a product of it. So when the, I was uh, working, unfortunately, the COVID came and, you know, a situation happened where, you know, my job got privatized and uh, it was a struggle. But uh, the, thanks to the American Job Center, um, they were able to help me connect with any uh, organization and I'm very happily back to work. Um, as a person who, you know, who was before this, I was very involved in the town, uh, Mayor's Committee of the Homeless Shelter, Historic Commission, um, in the Wetlands Commission before being on the Town Council in East Hartford. And yes, when you, uh, you are right, when it comes to uh, certain things like add-ons uh, to a place where you're gonna live, you know, planning, and it's more than just planning and zoning. If you're in a historic area, you have to go through the historic commission. If you are, your property uh, borders, wetlands, you have to not just go through planning and zoning, but you gotta go through them as well. So uh, yes, I am very, very familiar on the, the local uh, rules. I'm not saying what is right, what is wrong. It's, uh, you know, it is what it is. And I'm glad you are, you know, putting the effort in to uh, make it a better society. It's um, hopefully in the future to make, give this a quick summary. I want to say as a society, if we can always learn to put our priorities, then everything will be perfect. Thank you for your time. but there are plenty of people that are chopping with their own priorities. And so it, it really takes a, uh, a group of courageous individuals to keep moving ahead when there's a lot that's pulling us back to keep it as it is. Uh, too many people have to change 
together in order to make something like this work. But Walter, thank you so much. Um, it was refreshing to hear your speech. Uh, and you have become, maybe you always were, I, I just ha didn't have the privilege of being able to sit in on some of your speeches, but you've become a, quite an effective public speaker. So thank you. This, by the way, is going to be, it is recorded, <laughs> which means that uh, when you go home, if you want to turn on your TV, there you will be. Uh I got a haircut for this. Yeah, good. <laughs> very good. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. You, thank you. You made some very important Thanks. points that in many ways overlap with other things that we have heard, but it helps to fit it together. And, I, and before I go, I want to say hi to Krista. And thank you for being a part of this. Uh, she's been great. And, and uh, I didn't say it in my presentation, but I, I do want to say, uh, the council has a terrific re uh, relationship with DDS. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I, it's my job to be critical. Uh, there it is. But uh, you know, I have great admiration for Jordan and his team, and for Krista. And uh, you know, I'm sure together, one way or another, you know, we're going to make this all better. Thank you. So thank you. Okay, Krista, are you uh, remote? I am remote. I'm hoping everyone can hear me okay. I hear you. We hear you. Great. I, I, I'm struggling a little bit with the sound on my end, so I'm hoping that you get everyone can hear me okay. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge um, the first two presentations, Pam, Darlene, and Walt. Um, the information shared was um, really important information about some of the amazing things uh, going on in Connecticut, and um, we're so appreciative uh, to have all of the different initiatives moving forward. Um, like Walt said, Walt's work at the council um, has been instrumental in moving forward some really important initiatives and, and having honest and transparent conversations about where there needs to be improvements. So Walt, thank you. Um, I always enjoy listening to your presentation. Um, I can't wait to take a look at those slides a little bit closer and have some additional conversations. So thank you. I am going to attempt to share my screen. Um, I have a relatively short PowerPoint presentation um, that provides some general statistics and then talks a little bit about um, some of what we're working on um, in terms of new initiatives that focus on supporting adults with intellectual disability. So just give me one moment. I'm going to try to share my screen. Okay, well, I am getting a prompt that said the host has disabled my ability to share my screen. So <laughs> I'm hoping that there is an opportunity to change that. I think we just got the thumbs up. Got a thumbs up. Okay. Um, it's not allowing me to do that. What I can do, oh, I think I may have, okay, got it. Thank you to the presenter, uh, to the administrative staff that helped set that up. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, I see some head nodding, so that's good. All right. Um, so again, just a few slides, eight slides. I'm going to go through them relatively quickly. I know we have limited time. So first, just a general overview about who we are, um, who DDS is, who we support. Um, and, and, you know, we've presented at the task force uh, before, but because it's been a little while since we've come together, we thought it was important to really just start with a general overview of our supports. Um, again, you know, DDS is responsible for the planning, development, and administration of complete, comprehensive, and integrative statewide services for persons with intellectual disability and persons medically diagnosed as having prader willi syndrome. Walt talked a little bit about our eligi el uh, excuse me, eligibility process um, 
Intellectual disability is defined in state statute. We do look at IQ um, and there is an eligibility process that is required um, that individuals go through in order to be determined eligible for DDS supports and services. And Walt touched upon that a little bit um, and we're happy to provide additional information. I think some of Walt's points were really important points that um, uh, are, are, are good opportunities for discussion, talking about how individuals um, um, actually start to receive supports and services from the department. What is that first step through the door? Um, so always happy to talk further about that um, if that's something the, the task force would like to discuss. DDS provides services within available appropriations through a system that really relies heavily, the good majority of supports are provided through our qualified provider network. We do have some state operated services, um, but they are limited. Generally about 93% of our supports and services are provided through, um, through our qualified provider network. So they are integral into, uh, integral into what we do um, and how we provide supports and services. Um, DDS also offers individuals and families the option to self-direct their services. Um, this self-direction, it really is an opportunity for individuals to have more choice, to be um, their own employer. Um, they hire their own staff. They, um, they uh, determine where they would like and how they would like to spend their their funding through DDS. It is really um, it's an opportunity for individuals to become independent and make decisions um, that best fit the way they want to live their lives. So that is um, a program that we we do support. Um, and then we also provide some ancillary supports such as transportation, interpreter services, and clinical services. Most of the supports and services that we provide are provided through one of our three DDS uh, Medicaid waivers. Um, and uh, so, and that uh, allows for an opportunity to um, have some federal revenue come into the department um, and provide additional supports and services to more people. All right, next few slides are just some general statistics that we thought would be important to share based on some of the conversations the task force has been having recently. The first is just about individuals and families and Walt did touch upon this a little bit. He actually showed a picture of our of one of our first few pages of our MIR, our management information report. We issue that report on a quarterly basis. It's posted on our website. I'm happy to share the link with the task force, but it has really a wealth of information, statistics, and data about who we support and how we support individuals in our system. So there's approximately about 17,000 individuals and their families that have been determined eligible for various DDS supports. To Walt's earlier point, um, we, we don't necessarily provide supports and services to all those 17,000 individuals. Um, it depends on um, if they're active on one of our waivers, if they have annualized funding, what their need is, where they, um, what their level of need assessment is. There's lots of different factors that determine the level of support an individual will receive throughout the department. We're a lifespan department. Um, which is really important to mention as well, because a person's needs change as they get older and therefore our supports and services have to change. So just something important to, to note there. Um, and to that point, um, this little graph on the side uh, gives a visual of um, the number of DDS individuals that are eligible for our supports by age, right? So, you know, we um, do start providing supports and services to individuals that are children. We, we do provide supports to children, um, but the good majority of the individuals we support are, are middle age, so 22 through 34. Um, but again, this graph really shows we are a, a, an agency that provides supports throughout the lifespan. And how do people receive supports? They can receive supports through our qualified providers, which provide residential supports, day supports, employment-based supports, vocational or pre-vocational based services. We have our self-direction program, which I talked about a little bit prior. Um, we have DDS um, directed supports, which um, are done through our public uh, settings. 
Um, and then we also have a helpline. Um, the helpline uh, allows for individuals that may not necessarily have annualized funding or a case manager specifically assigned to them. They have the opportunity to use our helpline in which they can receive general um, general assistance and support, respite supports and services, um, and assist with uh, questions and concerns that people may have that are in our system. They also offer the opportunity um, to utilize some grants um, because they don't have annualized funding. And these, again, are for the individuals that don't have annualized funding and don't have a case manager specifically assigned to them. I'm just going to keep on going here. The next slide is about our residential supports. Again, I included a little bit of a graph here because I think it's a good visual to better understand where our residential supports are, are focused on. So as of June 30th, 2021, we had a little over uh, 8,000 individuals that were rec receiving some sort of annualized funding um, for a residential support, right? So um, if you break down the numbers here, we've got a small percentage of individuals that were receiving residential supports through a DDS operated um, setting. So that could be one of our regional centers, but we also um, oversee uh, approximately 30 CLAs, which are community living arrangements, also known as group homes. Um, about 5,500 individuals uh, are provided support through private providers for residential supports. So this could be, um, you know, a, a, a private run group home. This could be a CCH. A CCH is a community companion home um, where an individual um, lives with a family that's been licensed to provide residential support. And this can also be a CRS, a continuous uh, residential support. And that is essentially a, a 24 hour uh, unlicensed setting. Um, that is also something that's offered under our DDS waivers. We've got about 1,500 individuals that self-direct their services um, and receive residential support. Uh, usually that's in the form of IHS or individualized home supports, essentially staff that come in and can provide home-based services. We've got about 334 individuals that receive supports through private ICF IIDs. ICFs are intermediate care facilities for individuals with intellectual disability. Um, that designation is, um, is, uh, is, it provides an acute level of care um, with oversight through the Department of Public Health. Um, so just to provide a little bit of background about why it's designated as an ICF. Then there's another uh, group of about 500 individuals that receive residential supports through other means. This could be um, through a skilled nursing facility, through a residential school, um, through other means. But again, as you can see, the good majority of residential supports are really provided through our private providers. Next slide is about employment and day supports. Um, so again, as of June 30th, 2021, we've got a little over 10,000 individuals that are receiving some type of annualized funding for either employment or day supports through DDS. So I'm not going to go through all of the numbers here just because I want to be cognizant of the time a little bit, but I think the visual provides a really good opportunity to take a look at how our supports and services are provided across employment and day. Um, you know, right now, a, a DSO, just so everyone um, understands the acronym here, is a day support option. Um, so you can see that the good majority of individuals are um, are utilizing a day support option, but we also have um, a good amount of individuals that are in some sort of employment-based support. And as a department, um, we are an employment first agency. And as a department, we really have made a commitment to grow our employment-based supports and services and also grow our pre-vocational supports and services. Make sure that individuals have an opportunity um, to gain skills and gain hands-on training to eventually become employed and, and eventually um, perhaps gain competitive employment. So um, when we talk a little bit about new initiatives and where we're focusing a lot of our supports, um, you'll hear a lot more discussion around employment-based services. 
So I'm going to keep on going here. So the next two slides are about um, DDS's five-year plan. So DDS does have a statutory mandate uh, to put together a plan every five years that talks about not only our accomplishments, but what we would like to do over the next five years. Outline a plan, a plan for improving our supports, um, uh, enhancing our supports, expanding our supports, and making sure that there is an opportunity to make real change over the next five years. So our five year, our, our latest five year plan um, actually uh, just ended. So we had a five year plan that spanned from 2017 to 2022. Um, I, this slide outlines some of the accomplishments that occurred over the last five years, um, but I would be remiss not to mention that um, COVID, the pandemic, the public health emergency um, really made a, 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 an impact, a significant impact on the department's ability to move forward with some of these initiatives. Um, as everyone experienced um, COVID, forced everyone to make um, really difficult decisions in a really, really difficult time. Um, and DDS made a commitment to focus on health and safety during that time. Um, and unfortunately, you know, what that meant is some of the more progressive things we were looking at, like expanding employment services, just weren't as obtainable during that time. Um, we're now in a place where we're revising and we're reevaluating and we're getting ourselves back on track um, because there are many opportunities that still need to be explored, but unfortunately had a little bit of a challenge because of the pandemic, as we all experienced, right? I think we're all going through that opportunity of trying to, trying to figure out what the new normal looks like. And I think throughout the pandemic, we learned some lessons. Um, one of those lessons being the importance of virtual supports and services, maybe not as, um, a, as a, a, a primary, uh, method of support, but definitely as a complementary method of support and at times a secondary method of support. Um, so that's something that we're looking at integrating long term. So I'm not going to go through all of the different accomplishments, but wanted to give a little bit of a flavor of some of the things we have been able to accomplish over the last five years. The importance of really focusing on people and families first, right? We, we updated our residential waiting list definitions to make it, um, to more clearly communicate the need. We got a lot of feedback that the way our residential waiting list was, um, was structured made it difficult for people to really understand what it was talking about. Um, so we made some changes there uh, to make sure that the intent of the waiting of the residential waiting list was really communicating um, what people were requesting and the needs that were being um, articulated in the, in the waiting list. We also um, really focused on life course planning. And I know that Walt mentioned life course planning in his presentation. The whole purpose of life course planning really is um, to identify uh, person-centered planning, to make sure that as we go through um, working with an individual, that that individual's goals, that individual's um, skill set are, are things that are driving um, the future of what that individual wants, right? The importance of planning for a person and making sure that the person has a say in that planning. So we've really integrated um, the life course principles into our everyday work. We have um, staff that are becoming life course ambassadors going through a rigorous training to make sure um, that we are integrating um, person-centeredness into everything that we do. Um, we are, we focused over the last five years on improving our foundation, right? Really looking at how we are identifying critical incident uh, detection, how are we following up on critical incident detection, making sure that we've got a standard process for reviewing and updating DDS policies and procedures. Essentially, we were looking at the foundational structure of the department and making sure that there were, um, that there were formalized processes that allow us to make improvements. 
we looked at innovation and transformation, right? We looked at where do we want to be in the future? We implemented a supporting housing pilot with DOH. We implemented a step down unit to support individuals um, in need of behavioral supports. We expanded our in home support services and we really launched an, a reimagining day and employment program to gather feedback from stakeholders on what we want the future of employment services at DDS to look like. Those conversations are ongoing. We have numerous committees with numerous different stakeholders participating in ongoing conversations about what we want the future of employment services to look like. Most recently, um, we had a conversation in those, in, those, in those subcommittees about how is the department defining employment? What does employment mean, not only as an agency, but from the individuals that are participating in our employment services? So really, we're starting from the very basic foundational um, piece of how we're offering, how we're talking, how we're communicating about employment. So those have been really, really robust conversations that continue to be ongoing. Um, and we're hoping um, that some recommendations can be uh, pulled together and submitted formally, um, and we can present them at a later time. Um, again, I, I said I wasn't going to go through all of these, and now I'm going through all of them. So I'm just going to skip right to the very uh, bottom here to talk about uh, sustainable change, right? One of the things we really looked at is the ability for us to expand and enhance our supports, but making sure it's sustainable. We want to make sure that the changes that we're making not only um, provide a positive outcome, but it's an outcome that we can sustain as an agency. So some of the things that we did is we um, streamlined some provider enrollment processes. We worked very closely with our quality and licensing activities, not only to reduce administrative burden to make, but to also make sure that we're focusing on maintaining health and safety efforts. Um, that, you know, that continues to be at the forefront of what we do every day. Um, it was highlighted as an important factor um, in everything that we do during the pandemic. Um, so we've revisited conversations with quality and with licensing to ensure that that continues. We've implemented electronic visit verification. That is an electronic system um, that actually uh, was required for implementation on a federal level. Um, it is essentially an opportunity for um, home-based supports and services for staff to uh, clock in and out for home-based supports and services. It's a method um, for ensuring that the supports and services the department is paying for, the supports and services that individuals need um, are being provided and are being provided appropriately. Um, so we've been working on launching that. Just gonna keep going here. So the next slide here is to talk about our most recent five-year plan. So we did just issue um, within the last few months, um, our most recent uh, five-year plan to cover 2022 through 2027. So really the purpose of this next five-year plan is to talk about priorities and progress for the future of DDS. Um, and I pulled out a few of the major themes of that plan. I'd be happy to share the full plan with this task force if it hasn't been reviewed, but I think it provides a really good picture of where um, the department would like to be in the next five years. What are our priorities? What have we identified as things that need improvement? And what is our plan to make those improvements? So daily life and employment, um, again, we want to expand and integrate day and employment services. We want to offer an array out of employment-based services that allow an individual to work in the community um, and to work in a way that they um, are passionate about. Darlene and Pam provided an amazing presentation about some of the really unique abilities and skills that individuals have. And we have to take those unique abilities and skills and we have to leverage them. And, and, and we have to make sure people have an opportunity to share those skills um, with, with the community. 
We want to enhance assistive technology. Assistive technology allows individuals to become more independent. It allows individuals to look at all of the possibilities they have um, and allows them to do it in a way um, that they uh, can become um, that they have autonomy in, in their approach. So we're really looking at enhancing assistive technology. We want to look more about community living, right? We want to expand the continuum um, to include the most effective and least restrictive um, uh, residential setting. We want to look at creative ways for individuals to continue to live in the community. Um, we're trying to, to get away from a congregate setting. Um, if individuals don't want to live in a congregate setting, they should have the opportunity to live in the community. And it's our job to make sure that there are numerous different options uh, available for individuals. Right now, as you saw earlier, the good majority of individuals are living in a group home setting. Um, but there should be other options available um, that provide a more independent um, way for an individual to grow. So we're looking at all of those different options. And uh, the next slide, we'll talk a little, a little bit more in detail about what those options might be. Again, enhancing assistive technology. How is assistive technology allowing a person to live more independently? Things we're definitely focusing on and, and looking at as we move forward. Healthy living. We want to make sure that people not only have the opportunity to live in the community and live the life they choose, but are able to live it in a way that allows them to be healthy and happy. Um, and, and, that, and that can mean different things to different people, um, but it's part of our mission to make sure that people have the opportunity to do that. So it might be focusing on behavioral needs. It might be focusing on dietary needs. Whatever, a person, whatever allows a person to live happily and healthy um, are things that we're, we're, we want to focus on and we have to focus on. Safety and security. We want to make sure people are safe, right? Not only are people supposed to be happy and healthy, but they have to be safe. And the department has a responsibility in that. So we're looking at some of the things that we do to ensure people continue to remain safe. Um, incident reporting mechanisms, ways to detect incidents earlier, um, and ways to address um, incidents earlier are things that we continue uh, to expand on and, and look at. Social and spiritual, um, we are looking at opportunities to expand a person's ability to be a part of the community. And, and a lot of that has been focused around residential supports and employment supports, but there's another component to that, and that is participating in the community, right? Participating in recreational activities, in leisure activities. Um, being a part of the community means um, enjoying what the community has to offer. So there are some opportunities that we're looking at expanding both recreational and leisure activities for the individuals we support. Activity, uh, excuse me, um, advocacy and engagement. We want to make sure that people also have the opportunity to be empowered, to advocate for their wants and their needs, and to be engaged in the community. What changes need to happen in the community to, to allow a person to flourish? Um, and that happens through advocacy. So we've, we have um, uh, numerous self-advocate coordinators that work within the department. We are looking at continuing to support our self-advocate coordinators, make sure they're involved in every facet of our work. Their perspective is integral into what we do, um, and they continue to bring a unique and amazing perspective um, to the work that we do. Um, we also want to continue to encourage individual and family participation in all the decisions that happen within the department. Most recently, the, de the commissioner um, did a, uh, a, a forum called Seeds of Change in which he engaged with not only providers, but also with families and individuals and had a general conversation about how is the department doing? Where do we want to go in the future? Um, we we want to continue to engage with, with everyone we support and everyone that's connected with the department. And we continue to find new ways to do that. Understanding that there always are ways to improve. 
Okay, so I believe this is my last slide here. Um, and essentially what I wanted to talk about very quickly were about some of the new initiatives that are in the works, right? So what I talked about in the prior slide were general themes on where the department wants to make improvements and where the department plans to um, uh, uh, focus on in the future. One of the biggest initiatives um, that we've been a part of most recently um, is ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. This is a, a federal act that essentially has provided funding to states um, uh, to assist with a numerous different initiatives. Um, the state of Connecticut has leveraged um, multi-millions of dollars um, and is funneling them to specific initiatives um, for specific reasons. So in, in ARPA, there's actually two different pieces here. There is an ARPA initiative that's specific to home and community-based services. Um, and the focus of the ARPA dollars coming uh, through the home and community-based services was really to enhance, expand, and create new initiatives um, uh, to improve home and community-based services under our Medicaid waivers. So essentially, the dollars coming through ARPA HCBS have to be used specifically for supports and services under our Medicaid waivers. So DDS, um, along with our uh, state Medicaid agency, the Department of Social Services, went through a very um, intensive process in which we had to put together a plan to improve, to make improvements to our home and community-based um, services. Um, that plan was approved by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, and, and we're hoping um, to move many of the, these initiatives forward over the next three years. There's some really amazing initiatives that are that are um, that are being implemented as part of this process. I know Walt mentioned a little bit about the ARPA funding as part of his discussion. There's been a lot of attention um, to ongoing um, costs um, and what that means in terms of, of um, state investment. And I think those discussions also continue to be ongoing because I think, well, your, your concern, right, was that what does this mean after the ARPA funding runs out? Is this, it, are these initiatives just going to end or is the state going to be able to continue to invest state dollars um, to allow these initiatives to continue? Um, and those are conversations that are actively happening and are being looked at very carefully. Carefully. Um, there's been some discussions about specific initiatives, and I'd be happy to have conversations to provide more detail about what those look like. But just very quickly, some of the amazing things that are going to be done under ARPA HCBS is we're going to enhance the HCBS workforce. So essentially what this means is we are going to be, we have been providing um, payments to our qualified providers to assist with enhancing workforce. We know there's a staffing crisis. We know that the pandemic um, made a huge impact on the ability for providers to provide supports and services. Um, we've, we, um, we received approval from CMS to make specific payments to our qualified providers and designate those payments um, to enhancing the workforce. And not only enhancing the workforce, but stabilizing the workforce. So, so creating a process in which that money not only um, is going to hire new employees, but also create incentives for people to come work for nonprofits that provide supports to individuals with intellectual disability and stay and work with individuals with disabilities. Um, so, so that was that's a really exciting initiative that we've started over the past several months. We want to use some of the ARPA HCBS funding to expand integration and the use of assistive technology. I'm sure you guys have seen this theme there, but assistive tech, we really believe that assistive technology is, 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 a, a, is a future um, integral component of how we provide supports and services. Um, so we did um, uh, get approval from CMS to temporarily increase our assistive technology waiver cap to from 15,000 um, to 30,000. So what that means is that individuals 
who have assistive technology under their waiver supports and services will now have the ability to spend to um, look at larger initiatives uh, that perhaps they weren't able to spend money on prior. Um, that won't start until July, so we're still working through the details on that, but we're really excited about the opportunity to increase the ability to use um, amazing technology to benefit the supports and services of the individuals we, we, um, uh, we support. We're also looking at um, doing some um, other interesting um, opportunities for providers to use assistive technology um, that will benefit everyone that they support. Right now, assistive technology is a waiver service, so it has to be specific to improving um, the individual that, that the, it, that the, in, that the annual funding is, is um, articulated to. But um, with the ARPA initiative, we now have the ability to um, leverage assistive technology uh, so providers can use it in a way to help numerous individuals. So we're thinking about some creative ways to do this. The other piece about assistive technology that's fascinating is right now um, our waivers are not able to cover internet or broadband. Uh, uh, activity. Uh, CMS will not cover internet uh, services through the waiver, um, which obviously can create a little bit of a barrier because a lot of assistive technology uh, uh, really needs internet support in order to make it um, workable. But um, ARCHA, ARPA HCBS services are able to be used for internet and broadband activities, so we will be leveraging that in the next several months and making sure that individuals know it's an opportunity and making sure that providers know it may be an opportunity um, in the near future. We're going to be looking at enhancing self-direction with our ARPA HCBS services. We are um, looking at um, some really interesting initiatives that allow for there to be recruitment of new direct support professionals allowing for there to be platforms for families that self-direct their services to meet, to talk, to talk about best practices, to talk about things that have worked well for them, talk about things that maybe haven't worked with so well from them, an opportunity to network. What we've learned over the years is that, um, especially under self-direction, families have, have lived experience about what's worked and what's not worked, we need to make sure that families have the opportunity to work together and share those, share what they've found over the years. Um, we're going to be um, working through um, some transformational um, initiatives, and we're really excited about this transformational work. Essentially, this transformational work um, is going to bring in numerous different stakeholders and start creating a plan for um, providers to focus less on congregate settings and more on independence. So either living in the community and or working in the community. Um, so we're gonna be working very closely with providers to put together transformational plans and how um, providers um, in the future will be moving um, to moving toward a more community-based support system. Um, we're gonna be pulling in families and individuals um, and, and different stakeholders to have a conversation about what type of community services people would like to see that perhaps we haven't offered at this time. Um, we're really excited about the transformational work and, and we labeled it transformational because we believe that's exactly what it's going to be. We need to transform the system. We need it to look different in the future and we think that with some of um, the funding that's coming through uh, ARPA HCBS we can do that. We want to enhance our provider infrastructure um, that essentially um, we want to make sure that providers have the ability to look at the most um, the most up to date uh, technology and modern technology um, to make sure that their supports and services can be provided appropriately. So that is um, going to allow for some payments um, to really be used on improving um, or acquiring new technology. We want to strengthen quality, right? We're talking so much about supports and services, new supports and services, transforming supports and services. But one of the things we also have to focus on and making sure that the current supports and services um, 
are done in the most highest quality of ways. We have to make sure that our supports and services are being provided with quality, that individuals who are receiving the current supports are getting what they want from it. So part of this funding is going to be looking at how do we acquire <clears throat> better data on feedback directly from our individuals. We want to know, are the supports and services that you're receiving the supports and services that you want? Um, so we're going to be working on um, some uh, uh, ways to improve our feedback mechanism from individuals directly. We're going to be um, looking at some other opportunities um, uh, uh, to make sure that there is um, reporting of incidents or concerns in a more timely manner. Um, so improving some of our systems um, that allow us to do that now um, by expanding them to capture other data that perhaps we didn't have the opportunity to do before. And we think with those different initiatives, we can really uh, make some improvements and strengthen the quality of supports and services that are being provided directly. Now, I, 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 I gave you a really quick summary of some of the initiatives under HCBS um, ARPA, but there are many more that I didn't talk through. Um, I'm happy to provide a summary and or the link to the uh, state spending plan that provides a very detailed overview of each of the initiatives. Um, there's a lot there and we're really excited about it. The ARPA HCBS funding, we have until um, 2024, the middle of 2024 um, to use the funding. There are some restrictions depending on the specific initiative, but generally the funding coming through um, that, uh, that plan has to be used by 2024. The other piece I want to mention very quickly is the other component of ARPA. So there is another branch of ARPA uh, that was essentially um, bought, brought through the state plan. And Governor Lamont um, was instrumental on uh, deciding what um, initiatives and programs the state ARPA um, would focus on. So there are numerous different initiatives in which state ARPA funding um, was allocated, but specifically to DDS, there were two components. One was expanding respite. Especially after the pandemic, we knew families need a break. It's important for people to have a break, to be, allow for an opportunity to re-energize and allow for individuals to network, to meet new people, to be in a different environment. Um, and respite provides all of those opportunities. So um, some of the funding uh, through the state ARPA is going to be focused on expanding respite services. I know that there are a lot of conversations going on right now about creating a, a, a new, um, new respite opportunities, but also expanding current respite opportunities. So we're excited about um, the opportunity to do that. The other piece of the state plan ARPA um, is to support recreational and leisure activities. Um, like we said a little bit earlier in the presentation, individuals um, have to have an opportunity to participate in the community. And that doesn't only mean living in the community and working in the community, it also means enjoying activities within the community. And this is a really important component of the work that we do. Um, so the ARPA H, uh, state plan funding is going to support recreational and leisure activities. One of the specific items that we've focused on a little bit is camps, right? What do individuals do during the summertime? Camps are incredibly important and offers an opportunity for people to network, to make friends, form relationships, be outside and have some fun. Um, so some of the funding is going to improving and expanding camps, um, but also to support recreational opportunities that focus on connecting individuals with intellectual disabilities. So we're working through um, what that means and how we're going to get that money out now. So hopefully in the near future, we'll have some more details there. That is the end of my presentation. I know I went through all of that very quickly and there's so much to talk about and so much more to talk about, but I wanna be cognizant of everyone's time. I'm happy to take questions and I'm happy to also follow up with any additional information that may be helpful for the task force. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Hopefully this works. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krista. Um, 
Before I forget, and, and uh, we are running out of time. In fact, I think we're on borrowed time right now. Uh, but uh, Walter and Krista, if you wouldn't mind sending copies of your overheads uh, to uh, Beverly Henry, and I'll give you her email address. That's Beverly, spelled B-E-V-E-R-L-E-Y dot Henry at cga dot ct dot gov. Thank you. Okay, so we, uh, Krista, you gave us an avalanche of information, <laughs> uh, but it was done enthusiastically. So uh, it's sort of like a, a, a fine dinner that uh, needs to be savored as opposed to uh, nibbled at. Um, so don't be surprised if there will be some follow-up uh, questions that will be sent your way. Um, so I, I want to thank you, Krista. I want to thank you, Walter. Um, given that a number of task force members um, have departed, I'm going to conclude the meeting by simply uh, letting task force members know that I will be sending out a document uh, soon and in it, I will be requesting, uh, number one, if there are any additional uh, topics that task force members would like us to um, have presenters cover. Um, we've covered uh, 23, 24 topics so far. But um, again, uh, there's, there's so much. There is just so much in this field uh, that I'm not sure we can do uh, a whole lot more, uh, no matter how much time we spend. Um, but nevertheless, if there is an important topic, and I, I saw one, uh, Krista, that you brought up, and uh, it's on social and recreational leisure activities uh, that I think deserves having a presentation uh, to inform us as a task force. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do when I send out this document is to share a plan and a proposal that uh, I am uh, offering uh, as to how we can um, bring this process that we've been involved in uh, to its logical conclusion, which is ultimately preparing a report to submit to the state legislature. So uh, I'll share that and I will then uh, look for some uh, response to that uh, at, at our next task force meeting, uh, after you've reviewed what I'm sending out, uh, there are instructions that I've provided for uh, the next steps. And I've given, I've taken the liberty of giving each task force member uh, a responsibility, which involves uh, working as a small group uh, with one other task force member to address uh, briefly what we've covered so far at each date, uh, as well as what were the needs and the recommendations that came out of that particular day's um, uh, presentations. So with that, I am going to take the liberty of adjourning uh, the task force meeting. And I thank you again, Walt. I thank you again, Krista. And uh, uh, Pam is not here for me to thank her, but uh, we covered some pretty important topics today, and, and for that, I'm very grateful. So with that, I close the meeting. <laughs>